Hello again, Ron again. And in this video, we're going to talk about Transporter, the new FL Studio plugin that came out with, at the time of this recording, the latest update. So I decided to do something different for this video too. And I went through the manual and broke down everything and was hilarious. That is like the funniest thing is like, I spent the longest time trying to understand how the manual is written because it's a bit confusing. And then like directly after that, ImageLine posts their own video about it, explaining it simply. That's hilarious. But I'm still making this video anyway. So the purpose of this video is to explain how to use Transporter. So in this video, probably not many audio examples, but the benefit of it will be that if you're going through the instruction manual, it will explain each thing, one thing at a time in order. So let's jump into it. Starting from the beginning, Transporter is a new plugin that you only get with the all plugins edition of FL Studio if you were to upgrade. Otherwise, that means you have to buy it separately. Kind of like Luxverb, there are some plugins that they sell that way. And a lot of the time you can use them in other DAWs. So the ones that come with like the producer edition and maybe the signature edition at times, a lot of them are only for FL Studio. You can't use them anywhere else. But examples of things that you could use other places are like Maximus, Luxverb, and most likely this. I haven't really checked. So in the beginning, the manual says this. Transporter is a real-time relooping effect that triggers loops based on transients detected in the incoming audio. By analyzing the audio signal, it identifies transient peaks and uses them to trigger loops based on that audio, allowing for dynamic and responsive playback. Parameters like sensitivity, spread, and bouncing rate help fine-tune how the transients are detected and how the loops are spread in the stereo space ensuring precise and automated variations on the incoming audio. Sweet. So what's another way to put that? It's kind of like a glitch plugin that has more control to it, but it seems to be intended for melodies. All right, so that's the description. So now let's move into the plugin itself. So this, the visual display, it shows the input waveform when something is playing and you have these two, the thick markers, and these show where, so the waveform will appear here, right? These will follow the waveform and it will show you where the looping effect is happening at what point in the waveform. And these two, the thin ones, represents the minimum length, which you would program down here. And if you click, you can click on the top to update loop A, which is the green one. Click in the middle to update both of them. Click on the bottom to update loop B. So that's pretty cool. Because you know, FL Studio is good for like, like live performances in some cases. So got to assume that they were thinking about that. So next. We're going to go to the options menu. So you've got the themes, meaning you could change the color of it. That one looks pretty dope. There's light, which I like that one too, but less. The red one looks really cool because it looks epic. You've got the yellow one, which I like that. It's kind of like if a person was making music in a chill lounge all the time. So. I'm going to leave it on the dark one because I like the way it looks. So the next thing, if we're looking here, flush on pause or stop means that when you press play in FL Studio, that it will start to receive the waveform that is going to loop. But when you stop the song, it will not continue receiving the waveform. It will stop making sounds. Because as you can see, nothing is playing through it right now, but it's still trying to detect waveforms, even though nothing is there. And it moves continually. 
so when it's flushed on stop, flush is like flushing the toilet, right? It's like there's nothing in it, so it's not going to continue making sound. Otherwise, it would. So the next part of it is look ahead. And this is something that, to my knowledge, I don't know if ImageLine explained it, but basically, it prevents clicks. So the easiest way to think of it is kind of like what it does is like when you want to prevent clicks, if you have audio and you're putting it to a video, then you put fade in and fade out. So that's what it does. And it does that really fast. So what it says in the manual is that if you have something that has a lot of transients, that it can cause them to sound blurred. So you could turn that off. But if you're using a drum loop or something that's noisy, then you may not need it. And the way that I understand this is like, if you have a drum loop, then in theory, you have transients that are cleanly separated from one another. So they're not going to be like false positives. It's not going to be a case where it thinks it's a transient, but it's not because the noise will be really low. You got two settings in this mono stereo architecture. So it's mono to stereo or stereo to stereo. And it defaults to stereo to stereo because that's the one you're going to be using the most. Mono to stereo happens in the event that you have something where it's like stereo. You want it to monoize it first and then it's processed again as stereo. What would make sense to me to use that for is like, like say you have a, an input and it's old. So it only inputs on the left channel. I don't know. I can't think of actually a reason why you would need that. Like not offhand. But the stereo to stereo one, it just remains that like stereo audio is processing through the plugin the regular way. This is an interesting one too, because it sort of accounts for the thing that I was bringing up, where it's like you want to figure out if it's going to receive transients from the left channel, the right channel, or from both. And what it says basically is that left and right works most of the time but you choose the one that's best suited because sometimes the transients might be louder on one part of the signal than the other. Like the left side of it could be louder than the right side of it. It could have more information. Okay, moving on. So now we're gonna be looking at the loop section, which is in the middle right here. So starting with the minimum length, and this confused me at first because it feels so very unconventional, but when you break it down, it's like, an attack time. So when you have an attack time, the attack time is the amount of time that some parameter takes to reach to its full value, but usually it's with a compressor. But you could apply it to other things because you could have ADSR envelopes targeting other parameters. So basically what that means is it's something similar to that. So let's say we go here. This is on 0 0.02, right? So it's 20 milliseconds. After the transient passes, it's going to ignore transients for another 20 milliseconds. And it makes sense because it doesn't want it to be capturing the same transient more than once. So it's like transient triggers the plugin, then it covers that transient, and then it's ready to cover another one. If you look at the sensitivity, this increases the sensitivity, right? So it's like, how many of the transients is it going to try to capture and respond to? So if you have the maximum sensitivity and then you have the shortest minimum length, then you are capturing the most transients. But what it says is that those false positives, is like if you have a sound like reverb or something like that, where it might spike at a certain point, and it's not actually a transient, it could create a false positive situation. And that's an unwanted detection. So it will do something, it will detect something that you don't want it to. Next, you got the A to B ratio. And this is like, essentially, the way that I look at this is that B, you have these two loops, loop A and loop B, right? And you have the original signal that's dry. So loop A 
is always going to be the longer one because B is the ratio of it. So if this is two, then loop B is half of the length. So it's always going to be shorter. So if this is 20 milliseconds, for example, this is 10 milliseconds, that kind of thing. Or like, if it's a quarter note triplet, then this is an eighth note triplet. So that makes it easier to remember. Instead of doing it as so mathematically, like you've got to do some math, but you can see you can adjust this to different ratios. So it can become quite a bit shorter. It goes up to like one tenth. And then you can see how loop B is so much closer. But as I make this, as I change it, it gets closer to the green one, which is loop A. All right, so the spread, I'm going to be honest. This is easy, but this is the part that confused me the most trying to read it. Basically, what it does is when it's in the middle, both of them are in the middle, as in neither one is panned. As you move it to the right, you can see that loop B pans to the left, loop A pans to the right. So that's what happens. But when you move it this way, the panic is dynamic, so they shuffle back and forth. And as you move it further to the left, the pan shuffling gets faster, and it goes up to speed of 10 hertz. But when you read that in the manual, it's legitimately so confusing. But hopefully this makes it easier to understand. Okay, so here's another one that's kind of confusing, but you have the bouncing rate. So when you switch this to bouncing, you can see that this actually highlights. And when you make it negative, the bouncing rate will accelerate each time a new loop is triggered. If you make it positive, it will decelerate. So essentially what this is, is that this bouncing mode makes it like when you drop a ball, how the ball bounces and each time it bounces, it gets lower and lower. So when it hits the ground again, it's faster. Or like if you're a new drummer, when you drop a drumstick, when you're learning how to do a roll, it's like that. So moving it to the left makes that faster. Moving it to the right makes it slower. But it has to be in bouncing mode or it does nothing. See? You can move it, but you can't even. It's not like highlight. Okay, so the next section we're going to look at is bias. So starting from this part right here, probabilistic mode makes it more likely that when a new loop is triggering the plugin that it's going to change randomly each time it loops. So it's going to have constantly varying sounds. Whereas deterministic makes it, you could think of it like you can kind of determine what it's going to sound like. It makes it more predictable and it works better if you're automating the flush button when you have it in a beat as opposed to a live performance. So then, you know, there's no surprises when you export the entire song. Moving on, we have reverse, which I think is one of the coolest functions that they added to this plugin. So it increases the probability that the output generated by the loop will reverse the sound instead of recreating it forward. If you increase it all the way to one, then all of the output will be reversed. And that's really cool. Over here, you've got shift and all three of these work with probability. So you've got the shift the probability that the output will shift one octave away from the original input. And here you have the probability of whether it's going to be down or up. So when it's at zero, all of them will, if they shift, let's say if you don't have this at 100%, then every shift that takes place will shift one octave down. If you have this at 100, then all of them will shift one octave up. And if you have this at halfway, then it'll be half and half. That's really pretty cool. It's like creative. You know, it's like not static. It's like, that's, that's a great idea. 
you've got these different levels. So you have the dry level, you have like dry is the original signal. Loop A is the green one, and loop B is the shorter one, the red one. The only section that remains is mode. Okay, so the first one is auto, and basically that's kind of what you would expect. You've got the minimum length over here, and it's gonna just detect it as the audio plays through. And then the A to B ratio will determine how many transients are output. The next thing that it has is ignoring the transients. And what this is for is if you trigger some type of loop and you like it the way it is over a certain amount of time, but you still have audio playing through this plugin. So you want it to just loop the same way and ignore any new information that comes in. So it's going to do that until this is unselected, meaning that you would be automating this, you know? And after you automate it, you have it ignoring the transients, it plays whatever you want, and when you want it to play something different, you automate it so that it turns off, and then it will start playing something new again. Also pretty cool. Bypass is self-explanatory, it bypasses the effect of the entire plugin, so it will just have the audio passing through, not doing anything to it. Bouncing, kind of touched upon already, the looping effect kind of makes it glitch, like if you drop the ball or if you drop the drumstick. So when you switch it to adaptive, it will automatically adjust the minimum length based upon its own analysis of the audio that is passing through the plugin. And what it says specifically is that if you want more transient outputs, so you want it to make more beats, you should use a smaller minimum length time. And if you want to have less, then you should use a higher minimum length time. And that will dictate how many transients are output. And then you have tempo, which I feel is self-explanatory. So the audio will go in, but the loop that's output will be tempo-based. So you see, it will come out as quarter note triplets, and then the half of that, like I said, would be eighth note triplets. So it's useful because it's kind of like delay, especially if you reverse it because then you can have the dry sound regular and the output is reversed and you can mix these in and then you can pan them like that. So you can make for some really cool effects. I think I wanna do another video about this plugin where I'm demonstrating some of those effects. So if you made it this far in the video and you desire that, please let me know in the comments. Flush clears the buffer. So that's it. So that's all you need to know about how to use Transporter. As far as the controls work, in the order that they are laid out in the instruction manual. So if you are someone like me who uses the instruction manual every so often, especially to make these videos, then hopefully this makes it easier to understand because truth be told, the way it is written was confusing me like crazy. But I took time and actually tried to dissect it and then FL Studio hilariously put out their own video from ImageLine. So that was, that was pretty funny to me. I'm like, FL Studio Guru made it sound so easy and I was here struggling for like a day and a half. So with that being said, if you made it all the way to the end of this video, then I thank you for watching. And as usual, have an awesome day. Peace.